Hello everybody, today's video is about perspective. Perspective is very important. It's how two people can arrive at radically different conclusions and both be right. For example, from where that camera is, it's a terrible shot. I'm in the wrong place and you can't really see the car. But look at things from a different angle and all of a sudden they start to make a lot more sense. Perspective you'll find is going to be a running theme throughout today's video, which is of this, the newly released Honda Civic Type R Sportline. The 10th generation Civic was an incredibly important car for Honda and it had a couple of very difficult jobs to do. You see, for the few generations prior to this, the Civic was a car sold in two very different forms. The European Civic was distinctly different to that sold in many other territories, most notably the United States. So for this car, Honda wanted to consolidate everything and produce one vehicle on one platform that was going to please everybody. Never an easy task. And not only that, this was also going to be the first time the United United States was going to be getting the Civic Type R. In order to keep American audiences happy, they actually got a couple of body styles that we in Europe never saw. There was a saloon and also a rather unusual looking coupe that was recently discontinued because very few people actually bought it. However, with the Type R, production restrictions meant they couldn't do this. They needed one body style for the whole world and the only one they could really go with was the hatchback. But this is where Honda's genius really comes in and our old friend Perspective once again rears his head. Because if you look at the shape of the new FK8 Type R, you'll see it's a little bit odd. I think it's almost exactly halfway between the old FK2, which is in shape terms very similar to the previous FN2, a sort of triangular looking thing, very classic hatch, and a regular saloon. If you look at it with European eyes, you're probably going to see a hatchback. You've still got a tall rear and, of course, most importantly, the hatch. But look at it with American eyes and you're going to see a saloon because you've got your four doors and almost a sort of three box body shape. Honda then stuck a great big wing on the back and the resulting shape had more than a whiff of Impreza STI about it. A car which sold very well here in Europe and across the pond. But, as Honda learned, you cannot please everybody. And there were many out there who said, yeah, this seems like a great car, and I love the way that it drives, but I simply cannot love the way that it looks. It's a little bit too boy racer, with all of its sharp edges, said big wing, etc., etc. I know several people who said at the time, if only they made it without the rear wing, I would have bought one. And that's almost exactly what the Sportline is. It's a Type R without the rear wing, with slightly smaller 19-inch alloys rather than the 20s on the normal car, and a slightly more dour interior. But if you've already got a regular, slightly earlier Type R, there are a whole host of changes made to the new facelifted Type R that may be of interest to you as well. Brakes have been improved, the rears are marginally larger, the fronts have new two-piece floating discs, suspension is improved as well in both hardware and software terms with new, lighter, stronger components and a brain that works 10 times faster than before, meaning it should be able to adapt to road conditions even quicker. Being a facelift, of course, you've got the obligatory new bumpers, front and rear, but I have to say they're still very angular, very aggressive, and full of all these silly fake vents, which didn't look very good before, and on a car which is aimed at the more discerning customer, I think are perhaps still a little bit too much. At the rear, it's a very similar story. Yes, the big wing is gone, but what remains is still very aggressive and angular looking. The triple tailpipes are still in place, although believe it or not, those actually are designed to make the car a little bit less noisy. You've got the very dubious carbon here all round, and overall, Honda's gentrification of the Type R seems a little bit like chucking a suit on Charles Manson and saying he's a reformed character. Lift this boot though, and you will find one of my favorite pieces of design in the whole car. Not content with already providing an amazing 420 litres of space in the back here, better than some SUVs I've tested, Honda also fixed that age-old problem of what do you do with the luggage divider when you want to put the seats down and carry something really big. They're giving you this, very natty little retractable divider. It's genius, a great piece of design, and if you need absolutely every single square inch of space available to you, it'll even unclip so you can store it elsewhere. I love that. At a quick glance, you'd be forgiven for thinking the Honda hadn't changed a thing with the interior of their new cars. That's both good and bad. On the good, you have these seats, which are as comfortable and supportive as you'll find in any car in this class. I really like them. On the bad, this dash has not aged well, and the faux retro graphics that are used for the fuel and temperature gauges look pretty awful. Even worse than that, though, is the infotainment system. 
You see, in 2017, it already looked very out of date. Honda have updated it for 2020, but their update was chiefly adding some physical buttons to the side because people complained that the touch buttons were too difficult. The problem is, all of the graphics, all of the menus feel like they're straight out of 2010. The reversing camera is very low resolution, and overall, it's a very, very disappointing system. This is where Perspective rears its ugly head once again. You see, for years, people said that all they really wanted was a Civic Type R without the wing on the back, and that essentially is what this car is. However, for me, that should simply have been an option on the regular Type R. If you're going to create an entirely separate model line, really, you need to do a little bit more to justify it. Swapping out the red Alcantara for black I don't think it's really helped anything. In fact, it's just made the interior feel a little bit more oppressive, and I think in some ways less luxurious than the regular cars. Sure, a bit of red stitching and some more carbonish type stuff is very nice, but I don't think it's gonna really lure anyone away from their Golf GTI. In fact, these steering wheel buttons are all slightly nasty plastic, and they feel a lot less nice than that you'd find in a Kia. Honda, I think, should have gone so much further and created a Civic Type R Lux, put in so many more luxury features, spent a bit more time on that sat-nav, given us heated, ventilated seats, perhaps even a panoramic roof, which would have made the rear feel less like a cave than it currently does. As it is, though, it's just a weird mismatch of things that feels a little bit hastily thrown together, if I'm honest. There is more good news though. This stereo system, despite being unbranded, is actually one of the best regular setups I've heard in any car, and it's some way better than some of the branded systems that you pay a lot more money for with other manufacturers. But let's be honest here, the original FK8 Civic Type R was not a car that won awards for the quality of its interior. It won awards for the way it went down a back road like absolutely nothing else. So does the new, slightly softer Sportline lose any of that original car's ability? It's been now nearly four years since I first sampled the FK8 Generation Civic Type R. Back then, I was extremely impressed at just how ludicrously fast it was in the real world. And honestly, the intervening years have done absolutely nothing to dull that feeling. This is still unbelievably quick. You give it a road like this and it will utterly devour it. The only thing really that's come along in the last few years that could possibly challenge the Type R's dominance is the GR Yaris. And in truth, they are cars which exist really in very different market segments. You could say the GR is the much more special car. However, this seems to have more or less the same ludicrous traction, despite having only two wheel drive. It may carry another 120 kilos over the Yaris, but it's also got quite a bit more power. The engine up front is a two litre turbocharged K20 unit, making the same 320 horsepower that it always did. Of course, regulations have had their way and the car doesn't sound quite as vocal as it used to, but in fairness, one of the major complaints of the old Civic Type R is that it was actually a bit too raucous. That's why you now have that three tailpipe setup at the back. The middle one, apparently, helps take away some of the drone. I've spent quite a bit of time on the motorway in this car, and honestly, it's actually a very good cruiser. It's also very impressive in terms of fuel economy, because this will, on a long run, do 35 to the gallon. Unfortunately, the Type R's pitifully small 46 litre fuel tank means that your real world range is poor. It was a struggle to get more than 300 miles out of a tank even when not driving hard. And this is a huge blow for those who want to put regular miles on their car and it's a surprising oversight from Honda. The gear shift, often a Honda highlight, is absolutely brilliant. This little silver knob here has a 90 gram counterweight in it, meaning it's got a really meaty feeling and is genuinely an absolute joy to use. The steering is something that I was in two minds about when I last drove the car, and I feel very much the same now. It's very direct, very quick, but doesn't really talk to you all that much. It never moves around, doesn't have any texture to it. In comfort mode, it's light and lifeless. In sport mode, it's got a sort of medium weighting to it, but also does nothing. Then in Type R mode, it just sets the thing in concrete. Absolutely ridiculous. Plus R mode also makes the dampers far stiffer than they need to be, and the car really is best enjoyed, I would say, in sport mode.
I went through all of the press literature for this car and I can't find anywhere any sign that this has specific suspension tuning for the Sport line. So the only improvement in ride comfort have come from the new additions for the 2020 Type R overall and the fact it's got slightly chunkier tyres. In all honesty, the 20s that were on the regular Type R always looked like too much, and I was actually impressed that the car had any kind of ride quality at all. These are absolutely the right wheels for the car, and the tyres are perfect too. Michelin Pilot Sport 4S. A friend of mine has recently got a Type R, and he says that even in the wet, the car now grips very well. That's good news, because one of the old Type R's few flaws was that in the wet, it really did struggle for traction. Much like the GI Yaris, the Civic Type R is absolutely unshakable. No matter what you ask of it, it always seems to have an answer. You can chuck it into a bend and no matter how much you pull the steering round, it will just keep tightening the line. That front diff really does work. But no car is perfect and the Type R Sport line is no exception. I said in my original review that the Type R's engine felt quite laggy and this really is quite bad. Surprisingly so because Honda do make some fantastic engines. One of the best bits about their old naturally aspirated lumps was the insane response. This is ludicrously blunted. By 2021 standards it's really, really very poor. I would say that my Celica GT4 has better response when on the boil, and that's a car that's now 25 years old. Allow me to demonstrate. Third gear, and we are now doing 4,000 RPM, it's about 50 mile an hour. I'm now gonna put my foot down, down. There's the boost. That's bad, isn't it? And it's a real problem because the rest of the chassis is really very keen, but when you're trying to make serious progress, the engine does get in the way. Particularly on a road like this, when you go to make an overtake, you need instantaneous response, and this often doesn't have it. Visibility is okay, although in the rear, this new lower spoiler does seem to take up quite a bit of room, meaning that actually you can't really see if there is a car behind you. The typical Japanese reputation for unshakable reliability also seems to be taking a little bit of a hit with the new Civic Type R as well. My friend who just picked his up, granted it's not a new car, but it's also not that old, is already experiencing gearbox issues, and I do know these were quite well known for them, as was the old FK2. The reason being, I believe, that they're still using the same gearbox they largely always have. That's why the action is so pleasant, so short and direct, but it's just not built to cope with this amount of power and torque torque figure, incidentally, is about 400 Newton meters, so around about the 300 pound foot mark. Turning circle is okay, but not great. The AC in here is also not quite up to scratch either. Did a big long journey in it yesterday and it's been pretty hot recently. Today it's 28 degrees centigrade. That's really quite warm. For Americans, that's about 200 Fahrenheit. And the AC in here, at full pelt, even with recirc on, which it wanted to when I turned it to maximum, it only just about kept me cool rather than cold. And oddly, that side of the car was colder than this side, despite both being set to the same temperature. Even weirder than that, I turned the car off for a minute to get some pictures, then when I got back into it, I was showered with hundreds of little ice shards. Yep, don't know quite what was going on, but evidently something in there froze, turned the heat on and woof, fired out at me like some sort of Pokemon was hiding down there. Very odd. So in terms of the driving experience then, the engine is far laggier than I would like. It's still, point to point, one of the quickest cars you can buy. Very impressive given it doesn't have the bespoke chassis of the GI Yaris, its clever all-wheel drive system, and is a usefully larger car. I know the Yaris is still very much the flavour of the month, but for many people, it's just not practical enough to use as a daily. This definitely is. So conclusion time, and once again, we call on our old friend, Perspective. If what you really, truly want is a Civic Type R without the big wing on the back, this is a brilliant car. In fact, it's probably just a little bit better in the real world than the original. However, for me, Honda simply haven't gone far enough. To create a whole new model lineup, I think they should have done just a bit more than stick a slightly smaller wing and some smaller wheels on it. Because when you try and take away from the car's boy racer appeal, you instead start to look at all of its other features. And there the car, I think, falls some way short of many of its rivals. That infotainment is downright criminal. All the switches inside, just not quite good enough. The display graphics, feel very much outdated, and that engine for a turbo unit in 2021 simply isn't good enough. Yes, it drives brilliantly, but then so do many other cars out there. 
And here comes the killer blow. In theory, one of these should cost you about the same as the regular Type R. In the UK, that's around £35,000. So about seven grand cheaper than the somewhat slower Golf GTI that I tested recently. But because the market is quite strange, you're not going to be getting one of these new anytime soon. Instead, you have to look to the second-hand market. This morning on Autotrader, the cheapest Sportline for sale was up at £40,000, with one particularly cheeky individual asking forty-four grand, and that was for a car with over a thousand miles on the clock, so not even really new-ish. And that's a bit of a problem because you see then that makes this a much more expensive proposition in the real world than the Golf GTI. And despite its power deficit and very frustrating interior, I actually really did like the way that that car drove. And although I didn't like all the controls and infotainment on that car either, it at least felt like an infotainment system from 2021 that I hated rather than an infotainment from 2011 that I hated. And if I had to choose between the two for a grown up car, I think I'd have to get the Golf. But if that then is too sensible, I'd suggest you look at, say, something like the Hyundai i30N, which you can still pick up for a reasonable sum, or perhaps the now somewhat forgotten third generation Renault Sport Megane, also an excellent car. The Civic Type R Sportline is not really a bad car at all, far from it, but I really don't think it's the car we deserved, or one that seems to have been worth the several years Honda have been working on it. Thanks as always for watching, please like, comment down below, and we'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.